This is the Star Wars Podcast on TV Podcast Industries, and we're talking about Star Wars Ahsoka, Episode 7, Dreams and Madness. Withdraw the fighters and have them stand by. Why not allow them to follow? There's no need to waste our resources. With due respect, Grand Admiral, without pursuit, we shall lose them in the debris field. You're quite right, of course. Jedi are very good at hiding. They've been practicing that for years. However, we are getting to know our adversary, and if she's anything like her master, she'll be unpredictable and quite dangerous, which is why we must control all variables, put her on a path of her own choosing, so that no matter which direction she takes, we'll always be one step ahead of her. Welcome back to TV Podcast Industries, and we're talking about Star Wars Ahsoka, Episode 7, Dreams and Madness. I am one of your mad hosts, Chris. Hello there, fellow rebels. I am one of your dreamy hosts, John. I guess I encapsulate both dreams and madness. I am your host and editor, uh, Derek. <laughs> so a mix of both is required yes. to, uh, to finish this podcast out. <laughs> yes, you're exactly. You you are the and in dreams and madness. Okay. There okay. you go. You're the conjoining <laughs> tissue between John and I. <laughs> wow. You are the meat of our sandwich, right. if that makes sense. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> this is getting off track very quickly. I think we're almost at our Gen V <laughs> podcast, John. Exactly. <laughs> Welcome back, fellow Rebels. Yes, we are talking about Episode 7, the penultimate episode of Ahsoka, Season 1. Or the only season, we don't know, Mm -hmm. but definitely not the last we will see of Ahsoka and Ezra and everyone in between. But we have a lot to discuss. So if you like what you hear, don't forget to head on over to tvpodcastindustries.com to subscribe to each and every podcast catcher where this podcast is, including Spotify and all the other Big usual podcast locations. And if you want to be in with a chance to win some beautiful Star Wars goodies, you can join us for our Cantina quiz at the end of the episode, where every episode this season we are asking you a question. You pull them all together. If you like to get them right, you can be in with a chance to win some goodies. You just need to send those answers at the end of the season to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com with the correct answers and you're in with a chance great stuff and if you want to send any feedback to us about star wars is okay you can always email us to feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com or pop on over to our facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash tv podcast industries with all that being said and done we can jump into our spoiler filled discussion of this episode of Dreams and Madness. I am the madness, he is the dreams, and he is the and. So, gentlemen, <laughs> Derek, do you want to tell us who gave us what, where, when, and how with this episode? Absolutely, yes, of course. Executive producer for the show and showrunner is Dave Filoni. This episode Hooray. was written once again by Dave Filoni, and this episode was directed by Gita Vasant Patel. Uh, Gita has worked on wonderful shows on TV like House of the Dragon, Marvel's Runaways, and Superstore. Wow. That's, our, a, that's a nice classic. diverse it's the weird, mix, it's a weird isn't one. it? Isn't it? I did choose quite a diverse mix of uh, of shows that she's worked on. She's worked on lots and lots of stuff. But um, but Super Superstore was our COVID binge. Uh, we watched six seasons and watched the last season after COVID. So um, yeah, that's a special place. Yeah, <laughs> always great stuff and a great show. Johnners, do you want to tell us what they gave us with your synopsis for this episode? Sure. And Coruscant Hera Syndulla faces a disciplinary hearing with tribunal member Senator Zeno, objecting to her reports of a secret Imperial remnant conspiracy. As she defends herself, C-3PO arrives and provides the tribunal with an authorization by Leia Organa, forcing the court to absolve Hera and convince Mon Mothma that the threat is real. Meanwhile, Ahsoka and Huyang arrive at Peridia, where the Purgil run into a minefield left by Thrawn's forces and begin jumping to hyperspace to escape the detonations. Continuing alone, Ahsoka and Huyang are attacked by enemy fighters and hide in a debris field, compelling the Grand Admiral to adopt a more calculated approach. 
Ahsoka locates Sabine Wren through the Force and heads to the planet's surface, avoiding a further attack from Thrawn's troops. On the planet, Ezra Bridger, Sabine, and the Noti are attacked by Shin Hatai, the bandits Wren had previously encountered, and Thrawn's night troopers, while Balin Skull bids farewell to his apprentice and leaves to pursue his own agenda. Ahsoka's intervention leads to Thrawn withdrawing his remaining night troopers and preparing his imminent departure. Shin Hatai is forced to retreat with the night troopers or be left behind in this galaxy. Ahsoka, Ezra and Sabine are joyously reunited as Ezra hopes he might actually be able to go home. Yes, it's like Ezra has been on a night out and can't find a taxi. <laughs> Just wants to get home at this stage. You know, Star Wars is based on hope. <laughs> yes. And if it was any other show, I'd be going, shut up, Ezra. <laughs> Don't say the words, maybe I'll be going home, because that means you're not going you're anywhere. Not going <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping that this means that Ezra is actually going to be going home to his galaxy. <laughs> uh, me too, because I really liked Ezra in, in this episode, just because oh, yeah. we only caught a glimpse of him. In the last one, uh, and in particular, I think Eamon Asfandi uh, as Ezra Bridger, he got some really good moments just to give that kind of more youthful feel to this character, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, so I quite, I really liked his portrayal even more in this episode. Absolutely. So I hope he isn't going to die. Yeah, that would suck. <laughs> Don't do it, Filoni. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't do it. Can I ask one question? Mm -hmm. And again, before we get into our very spoiler-filled discussion, I have a Star Wars lore question. Okay. Because someone posited a question to me, and I'm like, I don't know. I, don't know. <laughs> I actually don't know this one. Okay. Do you think we're going to know? If, <laughs> if a Jedi, yeah. who is g good, a good Jedi, he has a blue lightsaber, green lightsaber, okay. and turns to the dark side, yes. does the kyber crystal turn red and dark? No. No. So the kyber crystal is a separate kyber crystal. It's a red kyber crystal or an orange kyber crystal, and it's blue or green or yellow or whatever. I believe so. If you so. turn to Sith, you turn to the dark side, any blade that you touch yeah. does not turn red, correct? Correct, because correct. the lightsaber that Ben Kenobi gave to Luke was his father's, it was Anakin's blue lightsaber. That's right. Yes. But if, An if Darth Vader picked up Luke's we created lightsaber, mm -hmm. his own one. That wouldn't automatically turn red no, when it's he just, turned it on. It's no. just the green lightsaber that yes. Luke built okay. himself. Yeah, good. Yeah. Because the, the the very fun one I've heard everyone going is, oh, the reason he Ezra's not touching a lightsaber is because it will go red the second he turns it. And I'm like, I don't think that's right. No, I don't no, think, I don't I think, don't think right. he's super dark and evil. And if he touches the lightsaber, it will go red, and that's how they're going to give it away. No, I don't think I don't think they do it that way. Actually, this is kind of a reference to the training of Kanan Jarrus and Ezra Bridger, because one of the quotes during that training, when Ezra is trying to learn how to use a lightsaber, um, is that Kanan Jarrus says to him, "A laser sword doesn't make you a Jedi." So Ooh. his that's a little reference to him not taking the lightsaber that he's handed over to Sabine and is calling her lightsaber now, which you asked about actually earlier on in the series. Uh, he's now saying, that's your lightsaber. I gave it to you. So he's not taking it from her. And he was told by his master in his original training that uh, a, light a lightsaber doesn't make you a Jedi. So. Absolutely. Yeah. We've seen General okay. Grievous with a ton of them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Excellent stuff. Well, with that initial bit of lore discussion, let's get into our spoiler-filled discussion of this episode of Dreams and Madness. We kick off with lightsaber point number one. We actually return to the other galaxy in, in our first saber point. So let's talk about Hera uh, meeting with the Senate Oversight Committee um, because we kind of knew it was coming. That's what, what we'd heard earlier on in the season, but I had wondered whether we'd actually see it in the show. We got a couple of episodes without Hera and this is the episode where she returns, so we get the kind of resolution to that storyline yeah. um, with some very cool moments. Uh, and I must admit, when I was watching it the first time, I really wanted that Senator Ziano uh, just to shut the hell up. Yeah. I was so sick of hearing his voice and his, I object, I object, not letting her speak, this is total crap. Probably because I was thinking 
they are actually going to court martial Hira here and she's going to have to run away from the rebellion and they're making terrible decisions. So I was so glad with how it worked out. And then watching it the second time, I could just have the pleasure of how the whole scene played out. Yeah. They are really setting that senator up to be a bad guy, right? Yeah. They're, they're like, they're trying their best, or at least they're going to do a, a, a punt fake where it's like, oh, you think he's a bad surprise? It's not. It was that other alien they never talked throughout this whole episode. It's the other senator that's on there who's actually the bad guy. Or it's the other female, <laughs> yeah. not Mon Mothra, it, who's that's, the bad that, guy. That's true, because I must say, through even though he was at Sindula all the time in this, for some reason I felt he was, he felt less like, the bad guy just seemed to be a terrible politician. Well, a jerk. no, no, a he, jerk. Yeah. he was just being objectionable. He was yeah. just the one dominating the oversight committee. Yeah, quite literally, yeah. I object. Yeah. I strongly object. Yeah. Yeah, but that's, <laughs> I am objectionable. <laughs> that's definitely how yeah. those things go, for yeah. sure. Yeah. So I think they're going to try and basically show that, like, this is within the New Republic. Yeah, there are the bad guys, bad guys. So the 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 original Galactic Empire mm-hmm. guys, the old, the old empire, the empire. But these are probably just new rebellion, new republic people. But like, they're just bad guys. Like, they're not bad. They're bad politicians. They're uh, yeah. very much, if it was real world politics, they would be opposition parties. Yeah. Like, still within the republic, but like, they are just not, they're going to try and make each other's political aspirations difficult. And we did see that in Andor. We saw the uh, the class of people who were in se- in kind of senator mode who were kind of going we don't really care who's in power as long as we're also in power exactly, and we keep yeah. our power and we we and we will agree with the things that even objectionable people want as long as we keep our power. So there are still some of those people around. Uh you know, we've seen that with the imperial remnant that's called out here by by Hera. These these people still exist in the galaxy, not being managed very well. Um <laughs> also, did anybody else notice another little uh character that could be from Return of the Jedi on the uh on the Senate here? I think I recognize Nyai Num, the pilot of the Millennium Falcon from ah, yes. uh, from the final yes. attack on the Death Star uh, on the Battle of Endor. I think that was Nyai Num there. Uh, certainly he, his species. It was certainly a species. Yes. He just seemed to have a mustache, but it's been a couple of years, <laughs> so you know. Yeah, he can grow some facial hair potentially. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, as well, coming back to Senator Ziono, maybe we've just got him all wrong. You know, we have no backstory to other than you know, Hera has said. You know, did you just stay back whilst others made the difficult choices or, you know, fought in the rebellion mm-hmm. until the fighting was over? But you just never know, yeah. like, what the background is. So maybe that's kind of the nice red herring about this. Yeah. And ultimately he becomes allied with Hera uh, at some point. But um I like that she stood her ground to him. You know, he was kind of unwilling to see or to take on board what she was saying. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he thinks she is taking personal advantage of yeah. a situation for her own gain. Mm-hmm. And this guy yeah. is a politician, so it is all about power. Yeah. And um, so that might be a threat to him rather than him being sort of one of the imperial remnants that he objected to as well. You so, might be, yeah. you know, I do I, have a line to him, though, where she says, you know, my, my job here is to protect the people of the Republic. And he says, did you do that in this case? And he said, yes, I protected them by not listening to you. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, <laughs> which was, that's which was true. Really that good. was a by good line. following yeah. your orders. Yeah. yeah. She goes, no, I didn't disobey orders. Mm-hmm. I ignored yours. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That was a good line. Should we talk about the big golden elephant that walks into the room? <laughs> I was just leaving it for you to talk about, Chris. Thank you. C-3PO, baby. Yeah. That Come on. I, I know, I know, like, there's going to be some haters that roll there and go, oh, you can never... You can never do like the the pass. You can never leave the. Pass. I don't care. C three PO. When as soon as he comes in, I love this character. Same yeah. as R two D two or any of the OG. Mm-hmm. Anytime you put a Luke in there, I'm happy. You put a Leia in there, I'm happy. We got Leia name dropped, which is definitely what she would do. And you got a full on C three PO coming in, yeah, doing his thing, looking nice and shiny. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, this was good. It also meant that we got a little. Chopper cameo as well with him <laughs> giving out uh, and getting angry because, you know, uh, again, the senator that shall not be named takes exception to a droid mm. giving evidence rather than 
than Leia. But uh, yeah. yeah, it was There was really... definitely a moment of, of Chopper going, hey, F you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 it's exactly. That was pure. No, he said some rude shit uh-huh. and they just kept it beep beeped. Exactly. Like, <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I really liked seeing C-3PO. Mm-hmm. Uh, and why not? You know, he's a droid. And, you know, as long as he's got his uh, his oil bath, yeah. um, he's going to be around for a long time. Well, we know he's there in the sequel trilogy, you know, he's, yeah. he's in every one of those as well. So uh, nice to have the appearance of him here. And again, played by Anthony Daniels uh, in the role again. So that's uh, that's always good as well to have uh, that connection all the way back to the first movie. So uh, really good. I will say, though, and I'm sorry to nitpick again, because I nitpicked last yeah. week and I'm still getting a little bit of uh, flack for my nitpick last week. Um his head didn't seem to be on right. Um, no, Grant, I thought the exact same okay, thing. And thank it looked you. like he just had a weird, like, usually they paint his neck with a bit of gold and they also put a bit of plastic underneath it. Yeah. But the actual join as well looked like spandex versus the rubber they usually put on or something. I, see, I wasn't even going, looked, I wasn't even going that off. deep. It just looked like he was looking like at the way ceiling. far upwards yeah. to where his eye line should be. It so it like looked like been, you could see more of the neck. Yeah. yeah, it looked like he'd been to a dodgy chiropractor or something mm. and had been kind of yeah. left at sort of a weird angle or yeah. something. Yeah. I was just more going if, they, if it actually wasn't Anthony Daniels in it and he just voiced it and they just had someone else who kind of was the right height and yeah. body type and it's not really... So it just didn't fit perfect. That's entirely just possible. It just, it, off. it just looked like he was looking upwards the whole time. And I thought, I was kind of going, oh, maybe he's looking up at the bench. That makes sense. Yeah. And then he turned around to look at Hera and he was still looking above her head. It's <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, no. But still, absolutely wonderful to have C-3PO back here. Really cool. And as well, because they've been dropping the, you know, this, um, this kind of backstory of Leia Organa being involved and her supporting Hera in this attack. Um, it's nice to kind of tie that up without having to resort to doing something unusual like de-aging Carrie Fisher or using old footage or something like yeah. that. It's kind of, it's yeah. kind of good to bring in such a great character from the original trilogy to kind of tie it up without having to, to do something. Um, that may not have played very well. Yeah, and we talked about this literally, what, four episodes ago, where yeah. I said I would love to have Leia back. Mm. And this is another way to get Leia back. You, Great way to you bring her yeah. voice in that of Anthony Daniels. Mm. Yeah, and it's it's also where this leads to, because, you know, although there was this cover-up with the, you know, belated authorization from uh, Leia, uh, Mom, Mom Mothma, you know, sees right through it. Like, I love Genevieve O'Reilly is, yeah. is really good here, even in the small scenes that she has, you know, sees right through it, but then, you know, questions her, well, you know, don't deny that you've got personal uh, attachments here, you know, in effect supporting Ziano. Mm-hmm. Um, but what is the reality that this, um, could happen that Thrawn is this danger to the New Republic. So mm-hmm. it would be interesting to see what comes from that because yeah. with Hera's line, you know, hope for the best, prepare for the worst, does that mean we're going to get the New Republic fleet? Like, in my mind, I suddenly go, does that mean they're going to at least station some of the New Republic fleet around CTOS mm. uh, so that when they jump back, there's suddenly a pitched battle or it doesn't quite go to um, Grand Admiral Thrawn's plan. Yeah. What is going to happen here? Because if you do think there's a risk, well, then at least station a couple of uh, New Republic ships there. I think that's exactly what's going to happen. We saw Thrawn on the other side leaving a minefield for the Purgle to arrive. I think what's going to happen is it's the same corridor effect with this hyperspace corridor between the two galaxies. So I'd say that's exactly what they're going to do. They're going to leave um, some troops there or uh, or some of the fleet there um, as a warning, waiting for him to come back so they can warn the rest of the fleet. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one other thing just in the scene uh, that was called out, which I really liked a little tie in to uh, Mandalorian season three. Um, they mentioned the battle of, uh, that Gideon had on yes. Mandalore, um, to, uh, Ziono. And he, he's calling it out, kind of going, well, that doesn't mean there is this imperial remnant, but he is, they, they, re- they are referencing that just to put it in the timeline of Mandalorian. Yeah. yeah cool. That is cool. And I mm. think that's exactly what it was there for do that yeah. line drop is to, again, we know now, post Star Wars celebrations that like this is leading to a film. So this is now starting to become chronological mm-hmm. um, yeah. in that we know where this is taking place in the big lead up to the, the heir to the empire. 
kind of film. <laughs> the Mandalorian um, movie, I'm sure it's going to be called, uh, so that it sells tickets. <laughs> yes, that too. <laughs> Grogu, the movie. It's Grogu, the movie, exactly. <laughs> Din Grogu. <laughs> oh, it'd be so good if Grand Admiral Thrawn gets hold of Grogu. Just puts, <gasps> oh, no. Just puts him in a fishbowl or something. <laughs> and, ah, and then he just and, explodes it. Yeah, just studies Grogu. Sort of uh, with a, be cl- a glass cloche over him. <laughs> but, gentlemen, should we move on to saber point number two? Because I do want to apologize and say I start to see it now with saber point number two. I promise the writing of this, uh, of the title for this, was not a dig at your comment last week that Grand Admiral Thrawn just has to show off what his bad power is because he definitely shows it off in this episode, Chris. Yep. No, <laughs> it was. He yeah, this is all Grand about Thrawn shows off his military prowess. Yeah, this is hundred percent all about his tactics, all about his yes. abilities and what and what way he uses his abilities versus his opponents. And I loved how they did you know, the shorthand version of it, I think he even actually says it in the way that a fan would say about Grand Admiral Thrawn. He goes, no, no, we're getting to know our opponent now. Um, we are making plans to be one step ahead of them. So it's a little bit more heavy on the dialogue rather than the exposition, but you get both of them. You get the yeah. visuals of what he's doing and you get uh, his planning against Ahsoka and the rest of the group on the planet. 100%. And like, look, now, I they did it. Look, I, I, I was the one asking for, give me the shorthand, show me why this guy is so impressive and why they need to fear. Um, and you see throughout this episode, including the very end, he's like, but you've lost. No, no, no. Uh, no, no. I won. They won the battle. I've won the war mm. because I got what I wanted out of this because we are now 97% complete. Exactly. Loading. And it's just like, oh, no, no. So he is. A general. He's not thinking about the pawns. He's not thinking about the rank and file. He is here to win the war. And that's how yeah. this is going to go. He is long game thrown, mm-hmm. yeah. basically. And I mean, it was just really well done here because, you know, again, you just have that little bit of, you know, conflict between him and Elspeth where, you know, she's saying you need to go after them. You know, we can take them out here. Because with Elspeth, she just sees that she goes, I see our enemies reunited mm-hmm. after he's recalled the gunship, recalled the fighters and so on. Mm-hmm. But he just counters that immediately. But the enemy have been distracted um, and we're almost have completed loading f- um, from the catacombs uh, in order to leave. And he's just like, Ahsoka has lost time that she can't reclaim, you know, and I intend to keep it that way. So it's just like... It's even just the intention. It's like, what are we doing here? It's not about, you know, he's always keeps pressing that at this moment in time, it's to get back. Yes. Everything else ultimately is a distraction. Mm -hmm. And because for him, he needs to get back to the galaxy yeah. um, in order yeah. to regroup the the Empire. Exactly. Um, yeah. With him at the top of it. Um, so... Like, it's just that tactical long game. And again, like you say, getting the information on Ahsoka and like just having the line in there, you know, it's great to have that. And that, you know, when he discovers that Anakin was her master, which means, you know, that means she has the potential to be hugely unpredictable and Mm -hmm. dangerous. And so we need to let her do that stuff so that, she feels as though she's making her own choices. So, I mean, it's like hugely manipulative. It is about almost, you know, the psychology of getting into your enemy. And that's what makes him so dangerous. He's Mm -hmm. not a knight sister. He's not a Jedi. He's not any kind of special power wielder in this universe. He's just simply a master tactician. Absolutely. Can I ask a quick question about his usage of the, the Night Sisters? Mm, yeah. Or in particular, the three the, the three mothers, they are an analogy or an analog for the, the three witches, the weird sisters, the weird witches. Yeah, it's so. kind of the three sages from classical, right? Mm-hmm. Because the fun part about that, if, if that is the way Filoni is making them, right? The three mothers are an analogy for the, the three witches, the weird sisters. They lead to the demise of Macbeth. Right. Like yeah. they, they are the, the actual kind of cause of and 
potential lead him on that path to his demise. Okay. And that's the kind of the way it's called out. Yeah. So him leaning into this power one more time, using the, the mothers to pinpoint Ahsoka in mm-hmm. this, is that kind of, and potentially whatever he's loading from this planet, potentially being connected to the, these people, the, the power, things like that. Do you think that's a sh- bit of a, sh- he's trying to pull some classical mythology story bits, or am I reading w- way too much into it? No, I, I think that that's an absolute possibility of it. I mean, I guess it's just too early to tell. Is it his over-reliance on them? Mm. Is it, you know, I mean, again, we don't really know what this cargo is. You know, actually, there's still an awful lot, despite now episode seven, that really is just unclear mm. as well. Mm. And we don't know what's in those capsules that they're, I mean, yes, we've postulated they could be humans or bones or something like that, mm. whatever it might be. But it could literally be to try and bring the Night Sisters back as a force in, um, in his galaxy. Mm-hmm. He might be using them in the same way. And it could be that that leads to his demise. I mean, you know, if you wanted to give at least the remnants of the Jedi something to think about, or bring another powerful, you know, force sensitive user at least Mm -hmm. uh, in order to distract them. And he's able to sort of use that almost as a distraction or by establishing them, you know, more firmly or more powerfully back in the other galaxy. Mm. Uh, something yeah. like that. I mean, we just have no idea what he's loading. It's from their catacombs. So is it their record? You know, yeah. who knows? If, if a Power? Thanks- like, literally, like, ener- like, I was about to say energon crystals, but that's Transformers. Yeah, I mean, but in, like, in a sense... The- dilithium crystals, almost. Yeah, but I mean, in a sense... <laughs> that's Star Trek. <laughs> but in a sense, the great mothers are moving house. They're up in oh, yeah. sticks and moving to a new pad. Yeah. And maybe he's just bringing all this stuff in order to keep them allied with him because he can then use their power. And it's whether that comes back to bite him because he just becomes arrogant in terms of, you know, what's been achieved and he, you know, doesn't give them the attention or even, like I say, with these little discussions with Elspeth I mean it's too early to say but are they the genesis of something where she's like well he's just not listening to me anymore you know because this is twice now in two episodes where her views are quite radically at least from a tactical point of view are very different yeah yeah but I, I do think she's there as the example of your standard bad guy Throw more men at it. Throw well, yeah. more of the army at it, and they just all get killed, and uh, and then the heroes win anyway. Whereas he is just really measured, and he's trying to teach her a better way, or is trying to show yeah. her the way yeah. that he does things are is much better. This idea of don't waste resources, hold back until you have a firm plan, then you've got the upper hand. It's no coincidence that his planning board looks like a chessboard, the yeah. one that he's watching all the battles play out on. Like exactly. he's, he's seeing every single piece and notices. For example, when Balin isn't there on the chessboard, just about to say, yeah, yeah. he notices that instantly. He's like, "Oh, there's a missing piece to the plan." Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. it's all the way through this episode. He's actually very fluid as well. Mm-hmm. So it's not just that he plans, but he is is being fluid with the the tactics that he's using. Exactly. In that, you know, call them off, reattack. You know, yeah. it's kind of like pulse attacks on them as and when he's gotten more information like well the night sisters have just provided the location so turbo lasers and Mm -hmm. then pursue ahsoka again after withdrawing them and equally like you say with ben skull because he does say that's as good as we're going to get given that general skull wasn't there with Mm -hmm. them you know so actually in his mind because balin was a former jedi general he would have expected it to have gone much better mm-hmm. with him not being there, with it being left to his apprentice Hatai, then he's like, no, we'll withdraw them. That's enough. Exactly. You know, uh, whilst we've, um, we're withdrawing and there's been losses, they're acceptable and we've delayed them for long enough. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So yeah. in a sense, he's actually mirroring, um, Hera there. It's like, Hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Mm-hmm. So he hoped 
they could destroy them, yep. but that's not ultimately that. That's a that's a size win for yeah. him because at the moment it's delay them so that they can leave, and then effectively the you know at least in his mind they're stranded there. Although they could always uh, hitch hitch a ride in the mouth of a of a pergol or somehow hitch a ride on his starship, uh, which is yes, possible. That's what's happen. Yeah, yeah, but it, it also you know a, a nice call back in a way to a, the different strategy from Grand Marf Tarkin, right? Um, give up in my moment of triumph is what got him killed yeah. back in, in A New Hope. Mm. Here with Grand Admiral Thrawn, he would have an option to throw out more troops, fight against these three people, kill them, and then move on. But he's going, you know what? That's enough. We tried it. Didn't work. Let's get out of here. Yeah. That's the bigger plan. So, yeah. Love it. Yeah. I'm completely across this now so like I, i'm happy that they are showing why based on my literally my my ask last week which was show me why thrawn's a threat mm-hmm. here they did they they literally put it on paper and put it on screen here is he is a military tactical genius and god help the the the, the, the new republic when he gets there because if he pulls together enough of an army He's going to outthink most of them. And again, we're seeing over there in our saber point number one, like the government or the actual New Republic government is already at odds. Mm-hmm. They, they don't agree. They are, they're not a singular force that is being controlled. They are democracy and democracies mm-hmm. bicker and argue. And that's going to kind of cause, whereas he is single minded. And very, very quick at doing this. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they really, they really kind of put it on screen here why he is such a threat potentially absolutely and and the senate are not ready for any kind of big uh resurgence uh to fight off basically yeah 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 exactly as i say grand grand admiral thrawn he's basically a big nerd so i really like him (laughs) you know as soon as he said must control the variables all Mm -hmm. the variables was like oh he's speaking my language (laughs) i love it i love it Um, he's a modeler he's a scientific modeler that's it that's it exactly um did you notice that little touch there that he does know who um anakin skywalker is yeah and remember he is gone after the Clone Wars, effectively around the time of A New Hope or before A New Hope, he's gone from the galaxy. Uh, he also knows who Darth Vader is. So um, he does know the connection between those two. Yeah. There yeah. you go. And so he was close to the Emperor, I'm assuming. Yeah, he was. He, yes. I mean, he Very. was. But I, I think his absence, say, from the original three, like New Hope, mm-hmm. Empire Strikes Back, it was always that he was kind of out somewhere. I mean, at least from I think Timothy Zahn's book, he he was almost like doing secret missions and, yes. and and secret development of new military stuff. And you get that a bit in Rebels as well, where you have this Tie Fighter, mm. um, new Tie Fighter uh, that that he is sort of preparing. So, but I, I think in Timothy Zahn's, it was, he was the super in super the super outer star rim, yeah, yeah, kind of he. His tactical genius was being used for the hardware almost, you know, in a Mm. sense. Um, And that's why he was kind of away from the action. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? No, I remember remember there was something like uh, another super weapon. So part of me, when they they were loading this stuff on um, to, to the ship, I was like, they're not loading on another, like, super power source to build a weapon yeah. when he gets back because they won't do that you've done that three times now mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> with the two ogs death stars and then the the, the one in force awakens the and death it's Star planet yeah so it's kind of been done that like i don't see them doing oh it's a new energy source that can potentially power my super weapon yeah because there's no point you don't need that level you, he he doesn't need that. You can see here, he, with his tactical elements, it could just, it's more the army and how he deploys them versus military might of a super weapon. Absolutely, person. absolutely. But there is a possibility that he could be involved in the construction of the super planet weapon that was in, that was in, uh, oh, Force God, Awakens, yeah. you know, that whatever he's bringing back here or somebody else is bringing back, which we'll talk about, uh, at the next point. Um, 
what they're bringing back could have a knock-on effect into the sequel trilogy, right? Yes. That's uh, that's where I, where I would probably leave that uh, that bit. Yeah, but yeah, but maybe. in contrast to the, to the original Zan novels, John, of course, just to reiterate, uh, the reason why Thrawn wasn't in the original trilogy was because he was taken out at the end of Rebels off to this other galaxy. So he wasn't even yes. there well, for that's that trilogy. True. Yeah, so, no, yeah. Exactly, so exactly. That's, that, that's the big difference. I always forget about that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so, so they have explained it in, uh, in canon, I guess, as, as you call it, in yeah. Dave Filoni's canon. Timelines, John, timelines. There you go. Multiverse. It's all the multiverse. No, it's but just timelines. It's, it's just like, <laughs> okay, where are these in the timeline? Yeah, where where are we right now today? Wait till we get to Loki and have to talk about timelines instead of multiverses uh, again, guys. Oh no, that's only that's, that's only week, week one week away. <laughs> I know. Let's jump on to our final saber point for this episode. Well, you can't have a saber point without a lightsaber, and we get a good few of them in this episode. Mm-hmm. Yes, we do because let's talk about the Ahsoka meeting Ezra. And Sabine, Sabine and Ezra having the face-off, and even Ahsoka having a face-off, another Jedi battle. Um, oh, it, yeah. was, uh, it was battlefield. Uh, it battlefield, really was. battlefield. It there really was. Can I just quickly skip to Balin and Ahsoka here? Sure. Yes, Be- please do. Because I loved this battle <laughs> so much. I was on tenterhooks because I was like, oh no, he's going to die. Mm. And this is going to be like, you know, the revenge of the Ahsoka. Mm, and, yeah. and, and in the end, it did pan out like that. Um, and I was like, oh, I'm so pleased because, um, it was just another great lightsaber battle between these two. And what I really stood out to me, at least, and I don't know whether it was intentional, but there is a pause in the dueling mm-hmm. where, um, it's almost the, reflection or the opposite of what happened in the other galaxy with um with the lightsaber duel on Cetos, where you've got that classic still now of the photos with Ahsoka's face lit up with the clash of the 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 lightsabers. Mm-hmm. And you get the opposite in this with Balin clashing and his face lighting up. Yeah. And I just thought it was superb. Whether it was That's intentional, cool. I don't or you know thematic in terms mm-hmm. of what Filoni was doing, but I just thought it was a really good sort of nod um, to what happened on CETOS in, in terms of that battle. And then ultimately, you know, when he says, you can't defeat me, and she goes, perhaps, but maybe I don't have to. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, just because that's not her intention either to exactly. actually kill him. Um, and I thought it was nice of him that he says, um, you know, she says are you disappointed that I'm still alive? And he's like, no, not really. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I didn't really want to kill you. Anyway. Exactly. exactly. Um, so I, I just really love this character. And I think these two together as Jedi is that, you know, having those classic lightsaber battles has just been really, really good in, mm-hmm. in this series. And this was just another one for me. Yeah, absolutely. I just love this character of Balin. There's just there's some really good moments that he has in the episode outside of that fight. Um, but the fight is fantastic. Like, really, really yeah, good. Yeah. I love his final goodbye to uh, yeah. his apprentice, where he tells her one last piece of advice, impatience for victory will guarantee defeat. Um, Shin does seem pretty hurt to be kind of pushed out, out on her own, even though she has always felt quite confident it's never felt like Balin's been the one ordering her to do something and being left alone. It's always felt like he's allowing her to go off on missions, whereas now it feels like he's kicking her out and going, right, off you go. The nest is, you're out of the nest now. Um, off you go, fly little bird, you know? Yeah. Um, and then we kind of have him going off on his own um, to accomplish his own mission. Yes. This is the other person I was thinking of that could be bringing back some kind of power from this galaxy that will lead into the Emperor's plan that fulfills the sequel trilogy, let's say. Um, we know they've been doing testing. We know they've been building up uh, ways of trying to clone the Emperor throughout uh, throughout the Mandalorian series. Um, but potentially it needs a little uh, jumpstart from another galaxy. So I wonder if the power that Balin is looking for might be that jumpstart. Um, that allows yeah. them to create that whole army of uh, of warships that um, was on display in that final uh, Star Wars movie. Yeah. Oh my God! Do you think they're actually going to do the clone of Luke? I hope not. 
the, in the Timothy Zahn ones for our listeners, mm-hmm. they they did clone Luke and they added a couple of extra U's and called it Luke. <laughs> so it was Luke, our Luke, the standard Luke, and then Luke with a couple of extra U's <laughs> too. So you understood which Luke was talking. Yeah, on the page. Um, they should have just called page. him Fred. There, of yeah, course. exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's so much easier. Or um, equal. But yeah, do you think the power is, like you said, that could be it and that's how we get... They could do that. Maybe they don't do Luke. They well, do Ahsoka. It, it is. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, it's interesting you say that and it, like this whole bit with Balin because when I first watched this episode, I actually just thought there was something missing a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, I not to say that I was disappointed because I really enjoyed it, but I also thought, it felt a little anticlimactic. So I don't know why. Maybe it's just because I was watching it early in the morning. I hadn't woken up properly. Whatever. I don't know. But the one thing I do think is it would have been really good to have seen Balin approaching something at the end. You know, like some kind of mystical door, you know, kind of yeah. night witchy looking kind mm-hmm. of doorway or something like that. I don't know. I just felt I get he's going off alone, but... Again, like I say, there's still an awful lot here that's not clear. We know he's looking for this power. We've heard him say he can, that's why he's come here. He can feel it. I guess it's the reason why he says, you know, we're going on in our separate directions. Mm-hmm. You go and join them in the new empire. Yes. I'm here um, for this this power that was written in the, you know, the text of the Jedi Temple. And I'm like going... Just, just show something mm-hmm. at least, you know, a it bit, a bit yeah. like with the contents. Oh no, I know, but mm-hmm. it, it's just. I, I'm guessing episode eight will be longer, but it's just. We hope. Yeah, that's my one concern. Well, they do a 36 minute, and I'm like, because <gasps> it's so actually you're like, oh bash, wow, what a poof, dish, and because at a part like when you, we had. Essentially, a load of good fights in this. Yeah, it really did. Absolutely. Like you had, uh, like you had Ahsoka versus Bale and Skull. You had Sabine versus Shin. You had Sabine and Ezra versus Shin. You, <laughs> then you had them, like Sabine against the stormtroopers. You had Ezra against the stormtroopers. Like you had these great individuals, which by themselves would be cool. And they shoved it all in. I was like, oh, wait, oh, oh. Because I'll say one really quick thing. They did exactly what I called with Sabine and the lightsaber. She did the lightsaber with blaster that we saw in the video game this year. Mm -hmm. Because it was so freaking cool. (laughs) Absolutely. That was cool, actually. Yeah. yeah. It was. Because, again, it happened so fast that there was just a lot in this. What, this was about a 46-minute kind of episode? Um, a lot happened in it, so I was just like, "Oof, that was a, it was great." Just give it more room to breathe. So I'm very hopeful that they give us a longer episode next week, which I think they might, based on the kind of other episodes so far. Yeah, um, I, I'm kind of resigned to the fact that this is going to be the biggest cliffhanger that we've had since um, Mandalorian season two, which was resolved in Book of Boba Fett, and then went on to yeah. uh went on to Mandalorian season 3. I feel like they're setting that up now. The big, the the big reveal here is the Thrones on the other galaxy has a way back and he's about to arrive back in the other galaxy. That definitely isn't being resolved next week. Um, no, I, I so agree. Un- unless I don't know, unless they take down the Chimera in this galaxy and find another way home in the Purgles and they just arrive back really happy with themselves on the other side of the galaxy. There's a way to do it in 45 yeah. minutes. Hey, that's half a movie, as we've said many times before. 45 minutes is half a movie. So um, so whether it's going to be a two-hour special next week or not, I don't think it is. Uh, don't be getting your hopes up. There might be another couple of minutes on, on there, but I don't think everything we've seen here is going to be resolved. We will absolutely spend time with Balin next week on his plan and whatever he's looking for. That has to be resolved because they're in a different galaxy and there's no other way back other than right now the chimera or the purple so yeah. yeah no exactly and i'm not looking for two hours I, i'm more kind of like you know the 56 minute mark or something like that a mm. bit a bit like uh a, an episode of wheel of time but it that was uh, again it's just like a little nitpick i was just like you know in the end 
some really cool stuff happening in this. Um, and, uh-huh. it, and it is building, and it, it's probably like Grand Admiral Thrawn is playing the long game. Uh, be given what we know with, you know, there's going to be another season of Mandal- the Mandalorian. Yeah. There's the movie. Who knows? We could even get an, a season two of Ahsoka, mm-hmm. but there's also just that breadcrumb of seeing something that he's going towards or even yep. Thrawn inspecting one of the, the capsules that has been loaded onto the, the Chimera, uh, yeah, something like that. But I guess that does need to be a bit more of a secret. Um, so that, that's all, but I love this stuff with Balin. Um, and like you said, Chris, the stuff around the notey, you know, circle the wagons, um, was really, oh, I really that this good. Was that episode. Yeah, that was this episode where they even, they also battled, Sabine and stuff battled the, the original mercenaries. Yeah. That they, the, the bounty hunters. Mm-hmm. That well, with the other band counters of Shin. Um, yeah, I forgot that was there too. A high speed chase. It was awesome. Like, I, I know, Chris, you kind of ran through everything that happened in the rest of the episode, but there were so many great moments. It, yeah. The, the high speed chase was awesome. I loved that idea. Yeah. And I loved that Sabine's here on another planet with her two blasters, which we saw her loading earlier on this season. So we know they run out of power. <laughs> the blasters do. So, uh, she can't hold off all of them on her own. Um, we have, Ezra here, who has no weapons, um, and he's saying that all of the people that are in it, all the Noti, are um, are a peaceful people, so they can't they can't battle. I do like that Ezra spends the whole time being like their father, going, "Stay indoors, I'll take care of this. Yeah. Stay indoors, yeah. keep yourself under hiding." Uh, and I like that they all their ships are armored as well. They have their little armored yeah. coverings so that nobody can get yeah. inside. That was cool. Did you see the little dog rat wolf? Yeah, it was mm-hmm. indoors the too. Howler. <laughs> yeah, the howler was just like, Meh. yeah, and and they were all riding howlers as well. So it turns out Sabine got a very nice one. Yes, um, yeah, because all the rest of 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 their uh, their species doesn't seem to be as nice as he does. I think it depends so, on the rider, I guess. Maybe, maybe something like that. She but... bonded with it, just like on Pandora in uh, in Avatar. Well, that's it. I... I mean, the other side of it is, I did like um, I like the banter between Ezra and Sabine, mm-hmm. where you know. She's realizing that the Noti really are not that great in a fight, uh, you know, compared to the Mandalorians <laughs> and herself. But it's just where she goes, you didn't tell me they were defenseless. Yes. I mean, it's just, just things like that. Um, I liked Ezra's when they see, is it, uh, Balin and, and Hatai in the distance and he's like, are they your friends? Uh-huh. You know, and she's like, no. Um, because, you know, she is still evading his yes, questions around how did you get here? And even talking about Ahsoka. Yeah. Like she's not telling him anything at all. Yeah. But and she did what every good nerd does when you have some time to talk with a friend you haven't spoke about in a while. She told them the entire story of the Star Wars trilogy. Yeah. Uh, as if you yeah. hadn't seen it before. <laughs> what was it that happened again? Oh, yeah. Then you got to the Battle of Yavin. Then you got to the Battle of Endor. And then uh, Darth Vader fell. And the uh, the Emperor went. And then she says the weirdest I'm in the writer's room uh, line written here by Dave Filoni, where she goes, yes, people say the Emperor fell. Like, ah, hang on a second. Yeah. You believe the Emperor died. Everybody does. That's why the Empire is gone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he, he literally fell into the reactor of his second Death Star, yeah. which then blew up. Yes, but Sabine going, well, some people say he's dead, um, to try and pave the way for the trilogies of him coming yeah, back. Yeah, that, that yeah. was a little bit on the nose, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, you know, curse you, J.J. Abrahams, for sort of those three movies that now have to be backfilled Absolutely. throughout the whole yeah. galaxy. I mean, you know... As I've always said, everything connected is great until you have to connect utter twallop. <laughs> <laughs> As he's always said. Yes. Well, I haven't um, used twallop, but no, you know. Never. I, yes, I, I get it. In our Marvel podcasts, it's like, I love everything's connected. It's great. But what if you get a dud? Yeah. And you've suddenly got to connect it. It's like, oh no, go yeah. revisit that. And it's that felt 
exactly like yeah. that. Yeah, but they did that in in uh, Doctor Strange, where they blew up <laughs> they blew up Black Bolt's head. So that's that's how you that's how you connect things that you don't like, yeah. like the Inhumans. Um, but I, the other battle I really enjoyed Sabine and Ezra um, versus the Troopers and versus uh, versus Shin Hata- ha- Haiti. We mentioned earlier on about him not taking the lightsaber, but yeah. I love his skill of using uh, the Force against against the attacking forces coming towards him. Yeah, I thought it was really cool. We've kind of noticed throughout, particularly in Ahsoka, each person that is a Force user has a different style of attack and a different style of defense. Some is trained in certain ways. Um, other is just natural. You know, here we have Ezra using something that we haven't really seen before, him using the Force up against lightsabers. That's cool. Yeah. It's yeah. awesome. You can see the lightsaber moving in the air as he's pushing it towards him. You know, he's pushing people away. He's pulling uh, pulling Sabine towards him so she doesn't get hit by a lightsaber. That's just some cool moments. He does lose focus for a second and then get knocked yeah. over by Shin It, it but, was uh, like that moment when Kylo Ren stopped the laser beam mm-hmm. in, you yeah. know, Perju's JJ. Um, that was cool. Know, that was very, very cool, yeah. and that character was very, very cool as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was like when that happened, and you're like, oh, "You can do that with the force, <laughs> exactly. yeah, exactly. You can fly in space without a spacesuit with the force." Uh-huh. <laughs> um, no, this okay. Look, this was cool. This was for me. This was the monk. This is the 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 weaponless monk kind of mm-hmm. thing. So it's it's the Buddhist monk almost, where not I am going to fight and take down an yeah. army and not have a weapon and use. Because I thought again, everyone was like, "Why wouldn't he just use the lightsaber? He's way better." And I was like, mm-hmm. "Well, then this whole theory of he's actually secretly bad and the bad power is in him was in there." It's but also again, just Ezra. Like I think exactly. that was a real Ezra moment. Mm-hmm. Well. I gave it to you as a present. Yep. Like <laughs> I don't, I I don't want it back. You know, I, so. he's also space Jesus now. When you have that beard, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it's he, the second coming. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, he he's did almost get a haircut from Shin Hatai's first attack, which I I thought was yes. a little nod to the most famous thing that Ezra ever did in his earliest appearances, which was went from an annoying kid. Gets a haircut and now he's the most amazing character in the galaxy outside of yeah. Ahsoka. But um, but there was a little nod when he uh, when she aims towards him with a lightsaber and he ducks and gets a little bit of a haircut yeah, and he goes ooh close. That that <laughs> that was good and I I do like it when um, Ezra says because uh, Hat- Shin Hatai is just stood there you know she's kind of <laughs> she's looking like a fish out of water a bit because she's just been dropped by a master mm-hmm. but it's like Ezra's like who's that and Swing so goes. She's like you, but without the sense of humor. And I was <laughs> like, that's great. Yeah, really like enjoyed it. that. Like um, I, I, I really enjoyed how Filoni in this episode and the director as well have pulled in a load of. We've talked about like previous episodes of this where we had very much like Lone Wolf and Cub, old school Japanese kind of Ronin films. Here you had a full on Cowboys and Indian scene where there was people being chased on wagons. We then yeah. had a Buddhist Chinese monk mm-hmm. kind of fighting against multiple people. You had a Western shootout with pistols. Mm-hmm. Again, around these little whole hutches, their version of it. He's pulled in a load of different genres in this one episode. And it melds really well. It does. The way that they're building this kind of, I'm going to say the Filoni Mandalorian kind of Ahsoka universe part of this universe, right? Where this, this thematic universe. Where it is very much uh, a Japanese Western with martial arts almost. Where you do have these bounty hunters and these blasters. But then you're also now getting these martial arts monks who can use magic type of thing. And it's just blended and stuff we've seen before. We've seen cowboy and Indian chases at high speed. And like here we have like people doing it just really well in this kind of sci-fi kind of genre. And it's just really working for me. Yeah, it just seems like like such a logical expansion of George Lucas's concepts because, you know, effectively all the characters from Star Wars were based on characters from Seven Samurai. Um, So (laughs) that's one of the inspirations for it. It wasn't just serials as everybody always thinks it is. It's, It's based on the Flash Gordon serials. 
it's that's where the sci-fi element came from but it's also the movie seven samurai specific characters taken from that so of course the person that he's most inspired his padawan learner uh dave filoni will take those concepts on board and put in a bit more of that mythology his history and uh, cinema stylings into his tv show yeah. so he's done such a great job uh really really good um one thing just before Ahsoka joins this fight as well, which I do think we need to talk about with Ezra. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, Ahsoka does an Ahsoka thing. She slides out of out of the uh, out of the ship, uh, <laughs> landing to the ground as as her Yang flies away, going, "Oh, I can't believe I had to do that again." Um, great, great moment there. But just before she arrives, Ezra's about to surrender uh, to to the troops that are that are attacking him. Yeah. He's kind of going. Do you not want to like take us in and question us? Um, you know, it seems like again a little old Ezra move, kind of definitely playing for time, trying to find a way to uh, to get himself in some kind of better position, but also a little bit of please don't leave me in this galaxy anymore. Please, there's a, there's a, an opportunity here. If you take me on board as a prisoner, maybe you'll take me out of this galaxy. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> I thought it, uh, to me that it felt really Ezra. This it was kind of stalling. It was trying to almost in a sense, distract them by thinking that, you know, they all think they're about to head into a fight. And mm-hmm. the first thing he does is hold up his hands, you yeah. know? And I mean, you even, I think you even see Sabine kind of like looking at him going, like, what, what, are, you what are you doing? But yeah. it, it felt really sort of Ezra mm-hmm. to me. And I really enjoyed it. That to, It's kind of why I was saying at the start, I really felt there was some, great bits of continuity mm-hmm. with this character and how and how Amon Asfandi is is portraying him it, mm-hmm. it's just really kind of good and I think that was another moment yeah. for me yeah. yeah yeah I have limited touchstones with Ezra as the character but th- this was a fun one um but you do start to see that they all want everyone wants out like there is something here more than just the the notey that is bad or like to make yeah, the weather, there for like me. we said last yeah, week. Yeah, it's Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, just like just take me back to the sun, you know. I just got to get to Coruscant. <laughs> Give me a bit of sun again. Um, well, we've all been there. Um, no, I and I I enjoyed this part. I enjoyed more when Ahsoka arrives mm-hmm. because Ahsoka just kind of really then starts to decimate that like between. Three Jedi, or two Jedis and a Mando, a Mando Jedi, um, Padawan. Like, you really start to see them all lose. And that's when Thrawn pulls them. He's like, no, look, it's done. Just get him out. And you see Shin, like, about to, that moment where she's about to kind of like, she's mulling in her head. Do I, do I fight? Do I stay? Mm, yeah. And I'm gone. Um, yeah. Cause they're like, well, side with us you can come with us we're good well interestingly and, uh, in there yeah there's an offer from ahsoka yeah. who says i can help you as if she's reached out with the force and seen that there is something about shin that isn't necessarily a sith that isn't a bad guy there's something about her that she could potentially help uh, i just thought that was interesting of, of, uh, no, it, of was. Ahsoka there. Yeah. it was really interesting and i i think it was you know I, because she's just been kind of abandoned in a sense by by Balin it it was also you know when she Mm. was there on her own it it, you felt like she was unsure and maybe that was projecting through the force yeah Uh, but I thought that was really interesting that there was this offer made to Shin Hatai here and which ultimately she doesn't take Mm -hmm. but that is potentially really interesting for what could happen in the future absolutely and um, and yeah i thought that was a not really intriguing little move here and mm-hmm. um, you know i do wonder if they'll they'll pull that again because I, I would like i i think they may i think i think they might yes. yeah <laughs> uh, yeah they'll, they'll kind of bring her and then she's another one for uh that puts shin in potential for uh, Luke's Jedi Academy in the future. Maybe. Like his new academy. She goes there to train again. She becomes, because she may become Ezra, bad one. Maybe, maybe. Um, yeah, it's, it's all really interesting, isn't it? Knowing that we've seen the sequel movies and how badly Luke's uh, academy goes. <laughs> I'm hoping that somebody else sets up an academy that we just haven't heard about. Like maybe Ahsoka uh, sets yeah. up her own academy, completely independent of Luke's one that, uh, that tragically uh, leads to the death of some quite big characters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, good stuff. Um, 
We do see the reunion, of course, of Ahsoka here and uh, and Ezra herself. So that was uh, yeah. that was a, a nice moment to have it. It was. I really love um, Hu Yang's call out uh, over the uh, after seeing them uh, reunite, going, "Ah, they're all back together." I hope I survive to see how this all works out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A great little, uh, great little David Tennant uh, voice over there. And yes, the episode ending with um, hopefully what isn't a uh, a threat of the future with. Ezra going, guys, I'm getting a feeling. I think I might be going home after all. Uh, uh oh. Um, I hope, yeah. I hope that's not, uh, that's not a bad one, as we said at the beginning. Uh, anything else? Any other notes? Any other points that we need to talk about from this episode? Um, yes, I've got a few, mm-hmm. I think. Uh, we do hear in when Sabine is sort of recounting what's happened whilst Ezra's been away. She says that Zeb is training recruits. Yes, she does. Yes, and yes. obviously that Hera then is commanding the fleet. So mm-hmm. uh, I thought that was kind of quite good. Yeah. And, you know, the other note I had um, is that, you know, Sabine does pick up on the fact that Ahsoka is using the force to find her. Yes. You know, there's that great moment where she's kind of, yeah. you know, Ezra's like, well, what's going on here? Mm-hmm. So while she's not able to move a milk jug, um, at least... It could be a bit like, you know, the sensation of Ooh, someone's walking over my grave. A little bit, I yeah. guess. But, you know, is that where Sabine is actually picking up on it yeah. in a meaningful way? You know, yeah, it felt he, like it. Yeah, because Hu Yang asks Ahsoka, do you think your bond is strong enough with Sabine that you're able to reach yeah. out and find her? It's it's not like you can reach out and find anybody, I guess. Yeah. It's, he's kind of saying that they have to have some kind of connection between the two of them that they can find each other over that distance. So, yeah, that was kind of cool that she was able to do that. Yeah. Uh, felt really old school. I've just got one other note that we just need to to call out because I thought it was a really good scene um, having Ahsoka kind of passing the time as they travel in the Purgle coming to the other galaxy. You know, it's it's also kind of saying uh, Purgle aren't as fast as the ship that, uh, that uh, Morgan and Elspeth has built um, to travel across galaxies. Perk will take a little bit longer, so yeah. uh, she has to occupy herself training um, as her master taught her before. So we do get a little uh, moment here from Anakin uh, looking like he did back in the Clone Wars um, on this training video. I think uh, Ahsoka calls out that he made about 20 of these for her that she could uh, tap into whenever she had time to do training and he wasn't around because... Um, if you remember from the Clone Wars, very quickly she was kind of out in the field on her own. Yeah. So I like this kind of callback that she was able to continue her training without being side by side with her master because he'd left these training um, modules, I suppose, for her to continue her practicing. Um, but there's some interesting stuff that's kind of layered in there. Again, the timing is interesting. He's saying to her um, that don't be afraid if we ever get separated. If, if, if you ever get lost, don't be afraid. Trust your in- instincts. I know you can do it. And this was the final video that he left for her. Yes. Um, which would mean very close to his his own betrayal, his own um changing yeah. over to the dark side. Um he also calls out some awesome characters from uh, from the era of the Clone Wars. He calls out calls out uh, you could face Count Dooku, you could va- face General Grievous, and you could face Asajj Ventress. Yes. Uh, the oh. coolest of yeah. the Sith Ninth Sister. Um, Absolutely. mixed characters. She was awesome right back from the original Clone Wars uh, animated movie, much better in Clone Wars and even better towards the end of her run. Uh, she's oh, she's so cool. fantastic. Yeah. I have like about a 45 centimeter statue of mm-hmm. her on Cost, a skull. Cost a pretty oh, that penny. one. Yes. Uh, the wonderful Asajj Ventress. So oh, he calls them out. What I also like about it is all three of those characters are dead at this stage. Yeah, um, so they were all true. still alive at the time that he was uh, he was recording this uh, hollow vid for uh, Ahsoka, but all three of them are dead there. Yes. <laughs> I also liked so, yeah. Ho Yang's little sort of layering in here of, you know, kind of just muses very thoughtful about Anakin mm. and, you know, he just reflects saying he was a good master. Yeah, Ahsoka's saying he was a good master, yeah. 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 And he was, um, yeah. until he turned to the dark side. Well, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Aren't they all? Aren't they all? Um, one one I'll just, final note, I'll close on my, my points are uh, the elephant boneyard fly-through scene. Um, yeah. So Theron using the, the Night Sisters to find Ahsoka in the bone field and her using her pilot skills to escape. Like, to really, and that really reminds you that Jedi are connected and are these amazing pilots not all of them but seemingly a majority of them because mm, they use yeah. the force to just zip through um 
yeah. the, these these bone field, and it was just it looked cool. It Maybe did, it cool. did, yeah. did it? Maybe she also learned that from uh, from Anakin, Anakin as well, it since he was be. the greatest pilot in the galaxy according to Obi Wan. Well, and yeah. also you know it, it had the feel of you know classic Star Wars mm. hiding the debris fields about it as well. Which Absolutely. Was what was it? Uh, Millennium Falcon on the back of the uh, of the Star Destroyer um, yes. until the garbage was released into space and they traveled out through all the rubbish in space. Yeah, that was uh, that was uh, a Han Solo move. Well. Yes, and led to the death of the captain of uh, that Star Destroyer it as well because he lost their quarry. <laughs> Very good. Good stuff. Uh, I think that's it for notes and points about this episode. Um, one more episode of Ahsoka to go after this. Yes, that is true. So, gentlemen, it is time for us to wrap up and give the audience our final thoughts for this episode. Derek, what are your final thoughts of Ahsoka Episode 7, Dreams of Madness? Love this one. We went into lots of detail here. Um, so I'm not going to add anything more to it. Uh, can't wait for next week. It's uh, It's been a really good series, and I think it's been building every week. And, yeah, Hello, C-3PO. Uh, welcome back, old friend. Uh, nice to see you setting up the episode and sticking it to that evil senator. <laughs> so that's my final word, isn't it? How about yourself, Chris? What do you think? Yes, much like you, we've discussed this in depth and I, in great detail, and I don't want to kind of rehash a lot of it. But for me, I really enjoyed this. I'm very cautiously optimistic that they will stick the landing in the mm-hmm. next episode. And I think that does then set us up with at least some form of kind of the the Empire Strikes Back style ending where things are not going to look great. Like, they're going to put it up with some form of, like, Thrawn's back. Uh-oh. And I think that's where we're going to finish. Uh, and I, I'm interested to see where they leave these characters. Will Ezra and Ahsoka be stranded in a, a galaxy far, far away from the galaxy far, far away? Um, so look forward to seeing it. But really cool to see the lightsaber fights, the blaster fights, and everything in between for this. So, yeah, really enjoyed it. Johnners, what were your final thoughts for this episode? Um, you know, I really, really enjoyed this. Um, I'd give this four whooper whoopers out of five, um, <laughs> which I believe <laughs> is Circle Circle in, in Noti. Oh, very good. Yes. Uh, whooper whooper. And uh, actually, weirdly, it's gone up. Um, so I really did like this episode. But as I say, there was just something in my gut that felt whether there just needed to be something else. Mm. And I don't know what it was. Cause episode I, I'm, eight. <laughs> well, episode eight directly after it, I guess. Yeah. yeah. And that's probably it as much as anything. Um, you know, again, I'm glad we were back in Corsarant. I think that's important. Mm-hmm. Seemingly, I would say for the last episode as well. But again, if it's not and it is to be seen, I just feel, you know, maybe it should have been indulged that over sort of a few episodes and so on. But um I just, I think it was just, I wanted something that I could hitch to around, say, like Balin. Mm-hmm. And maybe even a bit more around whatever those containers uh, are holding. Mm-hmm. But that was my only little gripe, and it was more just a gut feeling about it. I just wanted to have more. So, but otherwise, again... Great continuation of Grand Admiral Thrawn here. Um, I thought there were some really interesting moments here, such as uh, with Ahsoka and Shin Hatai and that offer, as well as with Balin and him effectively saying, you know, we're diverging here. Mm-hmm. We're going on our different paths. Absolutely love um, Balin's skull, as always. You know, it's actually... It's even more sad now that uh, Ray Stevenson has passed away because I just mm. wish he was yes. there to um, carry this character on, assuming uh, the character survives episode eight, but, yeah. you know, and or isn't stranded in this galaxy as, you know, the action heads off back to the uh, original, in quotes, uh, galaxy. Mm-hmm. So I, I just really enjoyed all of this. Um, I loved the Ezra-isms happening uh, here. So, uh, yep, four whooper whoopers out of five for me. Fantastic. Whoop, whoop. Whoopa, whoopa, I mean. Gentlemen, it is time for us to whoop, whoop into a tavern or a cantina far, far away. Let's head on to our cantina quiz. Yes. John, do you want to give our fellow rebels the question for this episode? 
Uh, yes, fellow quizzers, fellow rebels. Yes, it's question seven. What class of shuttle is Ahsoka's ship, as called out by Captain Enoch? Very Excellent. good. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's not named anything cool like the Millennium Falcon, but there is now a class for it. Yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. Good stuff. Do you want to get the question one more time, John? Absolutely. Uh, what class of shuttle is Ahsoka's ship, uh, as called out by Captain Enoch? Excellent. That's it. That's the seventh question of eight. Get your answers into all eight questions at the end of the season two. Feedback at tvpodcastindustries.com and you could be in with a chance to get your hands on some Star Wars Ahsoka goodies. Also, if you want to share your feedback to us, you can also email us there as well. Uh, first up, we do have an email that I missed a couple of weeks ago. I'm really sorry, Suzanne. Uh, this came in when I was getting loads of emails in for one of our last pub quizzes, and it came in right in the middle of all of them. So I missed it out. So really sorry. I hope you don't mind us reading this on the penultimate episode of the, of the podcast. Uh, but Suzanne back then said, hello, gentlemen. I'm loving the Star Wars show. I thought I'd write to you concerning the an idea I had about Sabine and her powers of the Force. They keep mentioning her lack of talent. Unlike most others trained in the way of the Force we've seen in the past, she is a Mandalorian. Perhaps the way she will tap into the Force powers would be through using the dark side of the Force, but not for evil like we've seen before. Mandalorians are physical, emotional fighters, exactly what classically trained Jedi are trained not to be. But is this the only way to use the Force for her? Perhaps not. Can Sabine harness the dark side for good, maybe? Uh, will this show totally change our idea about the Force? I hope we get something that world-changing in this show, along with the awesome fight sequences, acting, etc. I'm really enjoying watching along with the three of you guys. Thanks, Suzanne. Fantastic stuff, Suzanne. I really like that theory. Mm. Um, I am going to cross literally every appendage that i have uh to and hope that that happens it's very cool yeah because yeah. i think that's a really cool idea to be honest um yeah yeah great stuff i, I really like that idea i i i think personally they're probably gonna the, what i hope more for this world changing lore changing kind of piece coming out is this great power on Peridia that Bale and Skull is looking for. Like, um, whatever that is, that is going to be hopefully the, the, the universe change, galaxy changing power. Uh, and even if it is just the, the return of the Night Sisters, they were like, they've been weakened. Yeah. Cause there's only very few of them scattered around the universe. And now this army of them is being brought back by mm -hmm. Thrawn. That's pretty cool because mm -hmm. again, these are these all other, Non Jedi, Force sensitive, or magic sensitive uh, users. Um, it's going to be definitely cool. Excellent stuff. Thanks, Suzanne. And again, really sorry uh, we didn't put in the feedback a couple of weeks ago when it came in. Um, we also got an email in from this episode from Coffee and Vodka who says, Greetings, fellow reunited defenders. No Purgle were harmed or at least killed in the filming of this production. Noty either, it seems. Nice icing on a Star Wars cake with so much more spirit of the original trilogy than any live action for decades. Between this, Mando and or the purported ending of the writer's strike and the planned Fil Filoni theatrical projects, things are really looking up. Everything in this episode, from the hiding in the debris field, to the battles, to the animated band getting back together again, to the surprise classic cameos, was perfect. Do have to say, however, the most unbelievable aspect of this show isn't spaceships, brilliant blue admirals, or sabres made of light. It's how easily Sabine has, so far, been let off the hook. <laughs> Five Pergo Bugates, on the take millennial senators, and golden oldies <laughs> out of five. Peace and take care. Coffee and vodka. Thanks, Coffee and Vodka. Fantastic. Yeah, they're gonna have to address that in the next episode mm. at some point. Uh, like, yeah, oh, yeah. you're alive. Oh, and you're here. Oh, uh, uh, anyway, <laughs> kind of, it's just like, it's just like, we're just gonna just smooth one over on that one. As I said, uh, like any good Star Wars fan, she had time to talk to her best friend, so she told him about the trilogy rather than all the problems that she has in her life right now. Well, that's <laughs> true. How did you get here again? Ahsoka was dead? Uh, who are those uh, those two Jedi-looking people that are after you over there? Uh, it's complicated. Sorry. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it's also, let me tell you about the Ewoks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like, and as well, yeah, the, I mean, the battles were great. I, I forgot to mention we had the 
you know, the really weak sounding lasers coming from those, uh, those ships again. Ships again. Yeah. Yeah. And they just really feel like they would never <laughs> be able to play. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like they're it's, old ships. They're old ships. Maybe they've just gone past the point of their prime. I don't is. know whether yeah. they're old ships or not. <laughs> she owns she owns shipyards right. on uh, Corellia. Yes, yes. Sorry, yes. They're just really badly made ships. Yeah. <laughs> pew, pew. They put the pew, pew in pew. pew. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Thanks, coffee and vodka. Yeah, great stuff. Thanks, coffee and vodka. Thanks, coffee and vodka. We also got an email in from Darth Von Doom, who had this to say. Greetings, new Republicans. Sad to see so many per girl in peril. Were they killed or just jumped back to hyperspace? Is Mothma that weak a chancellor to let one senator disrupt the council? She was a powerful leader of the rebellion. Mm -hmm. Can she not have this dude investigated and exposed? Cassian Andor could get the job done. (laughs) Hell, Chopper could do the deed. Mm -hmm. He is already pissed at that guy. It would seem C-3PO's appearance saved some CGI fake magic to refute Gino's grandstanding. Mm -hmm. Looks like Thrawn will win the race home. As powerful as there is, he could still use a lightsaber or some form of a weapon. I'm eager to see what power Balon finds. He left Shin to certain defeat. Mm -hmm. The Ahsoka Balon standoff is a bit disappointing, but necessary to reveal his objective. Will Ezra reconnect with the Purgle to get home, or might they piggyback on Thrawn's ship? Looking forward to the feedback on this episode. The Force is strong in you. Darth Von Doom. Thanks, Darth. Uh, No Purgles were harmed. They all jumped into hyperspace by the looks of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yes, Chopper could do this deed. I am telling you. I'm pretty you. sure they're going to ch- at some point just make Chopper to be this, yeah. like, turns out to be an assassin droid in disguise. Well, not an assassin like, droid. He does definitely hold a grudge and will make plans. Like, yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't walk past any open holes or, or along the side of any buildings but, uh, if Chopper's around, if you're, if you're, um, this senator, like I'm just expecting him to just push him off a ledge and just kind of laugh but, but, heartily away yeah, to but himself. But it's even more than that. It's like when the senator goes back to his home planet, Chopper would blow the planet up, <laughs> That's probably true, killing yes. all the, you know, the, the whole of his. The casualties senator's of race. War. Casualties yeah. of war. It's like, I'm sorry. Uh, he really, really annoyed me. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. did you hear well, what that. he said about droids? Exactly. He's just going. Whoa. Ah, perfectly timed. <laughs> good stuff. Thanks, Darth Von Doom, for your for your thoughts uh, on the episode. Great to hear from you. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, thanks, Darth Von Doom. Over on Facebook, Joe Herber says, For a penultimate episode, the courtroom stuff seemed like a not very interesting distraction. Ahsoka training alone seems like something from an earlier episode. Last episode, Sabine not telling Ezra what's going on seemed weak. It was even worse this episode when the stakes were so high. What does she think is going to happen next? How are they going to get home? If she's young, maybe she hums and haws, but she's a grown woman and this is serious, so it seems dumb. Still, waiting to find out what Bela wants, etc. There's only one episode left, which doesn't seem enough to be satisfying. Thanks, Joe. I'm going to have to leave it to next week uh, to say whether I'm satisfied with the uh, with the wrap-up for the season. Um, but yeah, I did. I, I will say that Sabine not actually mentioning any of the yeah. bad things in all this episode seemed <laughs> seemed like. Uh, hang on a second. You've, you've spent time with him. You've had a chance to talk to him about it. Um, you probably should be telling him some of the dangers that are coming. Like Grand Admiral Thrawn is just over that hill over there, uh, your biggest and greatest enemy, and he's now got some backup. You might have been able to avoid him for ten years, but. Um, it's going to get bad for a couple of days. Yeah, exactly. Might have been a nice thing to tell him. And it, it's kind of a bit like uh, with the sex education thing. It's like the longer you leave it, the mm-hmm. worse it will become. The worse the secret becomes, yes. yes. Um, I actually really enjoyed the training. We didn't talk about it much in our very much discussion, but I thought it was fun. We, we talked about how kind of seeing um, Hayden Christian as Anakin there. Mm-hmm. But actually, it did actually serve a purpose here in that it kind of reminded her to have, do these trainings. She hasn't, she says explicitly, she hasn't done these trainings for years. Mm-hmm. She hasn't practiced them uh, because of that, the, the guilt she felt around Anakin. And stuff. So her taking these back were some of the moves that she used when she was fighting Balin. Mm-hmm. Um, so it does kind of tie directly back in, so I understand why they placed it here. Yeah. Uh, it, it was a good one. In fact, if anything, I think the courtroom scene could have been in any episode since Hera left. 
that yeah. could have been put into last no, week's absolutely. episode or the week before. Absolutely. There's nothing specifically to tie it to the other story. Whereas I think we even mentioned earlier on in the series, this idea of traveling through hyperspace. When you used to see that in the Star Wars movies, they always kind of hung out playing chess and doing things during the hyperspace jump. And then it suddenly became like warp speed in Star Trek. You know, it's like, and we're there. Um, <laughs> so it kind of had that element of, well, actually, Purgle are even slower than you're used to with hyperspace. They kind of kind of occupy themselves while they're inside the mouth of a whale wondering where they're going. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Good stuff. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Richard Blaze says, decent enough, but suffered from the usual of a penultimate episode just setting up the finale. Nice to see 3PO back. Bit of a surprise to see him arrive in the multicolored court. With all the mention of Leia, I did half expect her to turn up. Really liking Ezra, his playful chat with Sabrine and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was <laughs> great to see. His confidence and use of the Force was unique to see for a Jedi. Mm-hmm. The battle with Ahsoka and Balin was good, but not as good as their first meeting for me. Thrawn is really showing his true colours now, true blue, <laughs> and his military know-how is quite scary. So it's a long wait now to go before we see how this ends or sets up season two. Mm-hmm. Richard also mentioned to us about some of the actors on the show we didn't call out. Enoch, Thrawn's right-hand trooper, is played by Wes Chatham, who played the excellent Amos in The Expanse. Mm. And one of the great mothers, Clathau, is played by Claudia Black, most well-known for playing Erin's son in Farscape. Excellent stuff, Richard. Mm-hmm. I am so glad you pointed those out. Um, loved The Expanse. Mm-hmm. And so, yes, Wes Chatham, uh, the big thug, uh, from the expanse, lovable thug. No, though. Well, yeah. he started off as the big thug, but ultimately <laughs> became the lovable thug. And of course, Farscape as well uh, was was fantastic. So, um, yes. great. Uh, and Claudia Black was also in Stargate. Yeah, that's how I remember her. But I, I know she was in Stargate in Farscape, and um, like I had a lot of people loving her. But she was in the later series of Stargate. Yeah. Brilliant I loved oh, Farscape good. with the uh, Jim Henson puppets. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> they, were, I, yeah. they really were. They really they? were. Uh, but they were just so good. Um, I, it's a real shame that people aren't liking the Ahsoka and Balin uh, battle mark too, because mm. I, I really did enjoy it. But uh, I think we, we'd all the, kind of built it up after the last battle going, the next time they meet, it'll be the battle to the death because they had a purpose the first time, which was getting the map yeah. or stopping, at least stopping Balin from using the map. Um, this time it felt like, oh, they're here. And as, as you said, they walked into the fight and you're going, uh oh, this is the end of Balin. They're yeah. not going to kill off Ahsoka. I'm sorry. In <laughs> the show, that's their show. Like, no, exactly. but you're expecting this is the death of Balin. So it's going to be this massive battle. And then it ends off actually she's able to distract him and get away and, and move on with her real objective. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So maybe they'll face off one last time. Maybe. Yeah, yeah maybe. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, was, it was fun to see the, ha to look over there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's yeah. like smoke bomb. It was kind of, right yeah, away. it was the magician's uh, slight, I guess, yeah. the smoke and mirrors. Excellent stuff. Uh, thanks so much, Richard. Absolutely. Dr. Bob Phillips says, My grandma would have been proud. Life-threatening situation, but Ahsoka didn't forget her cardigan. <laughs> <laughs> Loving the multi-purpose mystic haggy sacks of the Great Mothers, and just for Chris, the turtle power of the Noti. Still not sure what's the real deal with Balin's skull, and want the finale to include the redemption of Shin. Have we seen Black Hawk-style sty- TIE fighters before? And... The light khaki colonialist vibe of the blue death guy is very nicely done. <laughs> yeah, I, I would think they probably took a little bit of inspiration for um, Grand Admiral Thrawn from colonials and their uh, their preference for wearing khaki. Yeah, so and probably also um, just Nazis. <laughs> well, that too. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. No, I guess we're also <laughs> colonials as well. They did kind of colonize a lot of places. quite a lot of Europe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, and yes, turtle power all the way. Heroes in a half shell, <laughs> noty power. And the haggy sacks uh-huh. is excellent. <laughs> yes, uh, they obviously they're kind of mid nineties uh, secondary school, <laughs> trying to learn some uh, juggling skills with the old <laughs> haggy sacks. Absolutely. And also, uh, Doctor Bob, just to your question, have we seen the Black Hawk down? I guess style 
uh, TIE Fighters before. Yep, they're certainly in Rebels. I'm not entirely sure whether we've seen them in live action before. I don't think so. Uh, but they are in... Um, they're in Rebels, for sure. And also in the the latest version of the Cal Kestis video games, uh, Jedi Survivor, mm-hmm. he is brought into Cor- Coruscant uh, on one of, of these TIE Fighters as well. Mm-hmm. They're kind of more, I think... Uh, terrestrial bound uh, right. gunships, as as you say, Black Hawk uh, down style, yeah. <laughs> Black Hawk style. Yes, yeah. it's not every Black Hawk goes down just because the movie that was one Black Hawk that well, went no. down. <laughs> They're Imperial uh, ships, so. They, they probably will get it. They, they, they will. They will fall out of the sky <laughs> um, if they're not shot out of the sky. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Good stuff. Thanks so much, Doctor Bob. Thanks so much, Doctor Bob. Yeah. Thanks, Doctor Bob. Our next and final piece of feedback comes from Mindy Megan, who had this to say. I don't think the inner child in me will ever not get excited when I hear or see C-3PO popping up in new places we haven't seen him before. And hearing him talk about Leia, such a treat. (laughs) I love that we got some bonus Hero Chopper and Carson Tava time when we had good reason to think we've seen the last of them for now. Overall, I really enjoyed this episode. We got to see a lot of big things and pleasant surprises. I love not knowing which way Shin Haiti is going to go, but I really wish I knew more about which way Balin's skull was going to go, since we're unfortunately getting such a finite amount of this character in this way. Again, not having much background on Ezra, I do wish we got to see Sabine telling him all the complicated details of what brought her there. Or at least... A cut to at she told him. I also found myself really wanting to see him pick up his lightsaber and use it in a fight rather than just four hands. Mm. Hashtag save the space whales. P.S. Sorry, Derek. I know you're annoying for the term, but everyone keeps saying whales. I'm with you, Mindy. Save the space whales. <laughs> Don't worry, Mindy. I... Uh, began to question myself this week because someone else on Twitter uh, was telling me that um, it's okay to call them space whales. It's like us uh, having different names for uh, for creatures on our planet. I'm, st- I'm still kind of going, but there's no whales in the galaxy far, far away. They've never had whales, so why would they call them space whales? And then this whole episode, everybody kept calling them space whales throughout the episode. And again, I was going, why are they doing that? And then thought, hang on a second. Did they ever actually say Purgle in the show? <laughs> and started to question myself. I had to go back and watch. And Huyang definitely calls them Purgle out loud. And in the uh, subtitles, they're called Purgle as yeah, well. So, because it's, it's too long space whales. Yeah. But I did question myself thinking, had I actually heard it or did I just know it from, <laughs> from Rebels? <laughs> it, it is weird, isn't it? Because as I say, it's like, you know, Chewbacca, always known as a Wookiee. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas Ewoks were always like cute teddies <laughs> teddy bears <laughs> so i guess it it depends but like han and luke kitchen. didn't turn around and go oh look at the teddy bears over well, there well no exactly you know. that is true yeah. that is true that, that's all i mean i think personally it's going to be like the genus is they are space whales but their actual name for the species is purgle it's kind of like they're there's loads of sharks well, there's actually great white sharks and hammerhead sharks. So there's loads of space whales. But this particular type of space whale <laughs> is a Virgo. Are you just I'm trying to describe how trying. you call giraffes giraffes and lions lions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And these but then burgles. there's some species of giraffes called like short neck giraffes. Yeah, no, exactly. Giraffes. But then it'd be so short space whale purgles or non space whale purgles. <laughs> short neck giraffe. <laughs> a I'm pretty Is that sure just a young it. giraffe? <laughs> it's a baby giraffe. Okay, I'm trying right. here. I'm it's trying not to a make different this species. sense for you. It's just young. I don't think you need to, you need to do it, Chris. You're, you don't have to defend it, and nobody else has to defend it anymore. It was a very small nitpick, but I did start to question myself after uh, <laughs> after the uh, the uh, messages during the week this week. Uh, great stuff, but thanks so much, Mindy, for yeah. uh, for your email. Uh, I totally agree with you. It's so so nice to see uh, C three PO uh, back in any show. I'll always, I'll always jump up and down for that. That's, that yeah. was very cool, uh, and just seeing him interact with Chopper as well for a quick second. I know Chopper was actually reacting to the senator, but uh, just having the two of them on screen in live action is cool. Absolutely, really, really good. And uh, I'm totally with you. I love the Shin 
Hatai, uh, you know, not knowing which way she's going to go. Mm-hmm. And I'm with you around Balin's skull because I just really enjoy this character. And there's only one episode left mm-hmm. with Ray Stevenson yeah. actually doing this character. And I really enjoyed what he's brought, just that, that kind of majesty kind of of... You know, I mean, you even hear it with Thrawn saying, you know, General Balan Skull, mm-hmm. like the, the that kind of dignity of him. And um yeah, which way is he going to go? I, I hope there is some resolution. I think that's what kind of that was my nitpick in, in this as well. Um Just just from the gut, really. Mm-hmm. But thanks, Mindy. Absolutely. Thanks, Mindy. Great stuff. Thanks, Mindy. And that's the end of our feedback for this episode. So that means we're at the end of this episode. Yes, we will be back next week for the finale of Star Wars Ahsoka Season 1, hopefully. But we'll also be back for the finale of The Wheel of Time Season 2, ahead of its Season 3. Yes, that is a definite Season 3 coming on that one. So, it is going to be a busy couple of days because we also have gen v launching this week over on prime video and next week you have loki season two kicking off on disney plus yes it is going to be a busy time for us tv podcast industry hosts but it's gonna be a good one Absolutely, yes. The first three episodes of Gen V should be in your feed on if you're subscribed on TV Podcast Industries or on The Boys Podcast. They should be in your feed right now. Uh, Self and John got to record that last week. Unfortunately, Chris uh, can't join us for the Gen V at the moment. Um, there are four different shows going on at the moment, but uh, he will be back with us uh, for uh, one of those shows, at least later on, once, uh, once we finish up our coverage of The Wheel of Time and Ahsoka as well. Uh, one quick note on the... Um, Pub quiz, cantina quizzes, um, tavern quizzes that are going on. We've got loads of them that are going on at the moment. We're not going to be able to do wrap ups for every single one of our shows. So we are going to wrap up all of our pub quizzes together uh, sometime later in October when things calm down a bit. So it'll be a big old uh, podcast special of giving stuff away. We might coincide it with our 800 episode, which is only about six episodes away. So that should oh happen God, in October. Really? <laughs> so yeah. yeah. We podcast too much, people. I know, I know. Oh it, my god! But we'll have a big yes. shindig. We'll we'll make sure we've got a bottle of writer's tears or something. There you go. Us. There you go. <laughs> Giving away goodies uh, works works for a, a big celebration episode like the eight hundred. Brilliant stuff. Thanks so much for joining us. Talk to you again next time. Yes, thank you so much, and we will speak to you again next week. Bye bye. Yes, good stuff, fellow rebels. Thank you for joining us as always. Great chatting with you. Until next time, though, keep watching, keep listening, and keep rebelling. R.I.P. Captain Nida.